Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Station is ready. BBC World News, this is Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. We have established contact with Paolo Nespo. Alpha, this is BBC News in London. How do you hear me? Please, the... Uh... BBC News, this is Station. We hear loud and clear. Hearing us. Now or I'm Thank you. I am now handing you over to BBC anchor Tim Wilcox. Please go ahead. You're watching BBC News. We are live Hello, everybody. on the International Space Station with the Italian astronaut Paolo Nespoli. He's been up there a month. Hello, Paolo. Can you hear us? Video loud and clear. Welcome on board of the Columbus, uh, European Columbus Laboratory on the International Space Station. Paolo, there's quite a big delay, I'm afraid. I think some seven or eight seconds. But how are you feeling? You've been up there a month. Very good, very good. The launch was uh, very nice. Uh, everything went uh, pretty good. Uh, two days on this uh, small uh, vehicle, uh, which is the, Rus the Russian Soyuz uh, spacecraft. But then we docked to the station, and here we are in our home, in our laboratory, and it's very nice to be here. Said uh, the small vehicle Soyuz, because I think you're six foot six or six foot seven. A bit of a tight squeeze for you to get in there. Was that uncomfortable? The journey up. Actually, I'm 6'2", uh, uh, but it, even at 6'2", it's, uh, it's quite, uh, I wouldn't say uncomfortable. The, the, the Soyuz was uh, made for a smaller people. In fact, I had to make a little mo modification on the seat to fit me in there, but, but it's okay. I mean, once, uh, once you are in space, uh, everything, even small spaces, get this three-dimensional effect, so you can have people on the, on the ceiling, either on the floor, either on the walls. So it gets uh, a little bit more comfortable. The important thing, though, is not uh, comfort, uh, but it's the fact that the Soyuz is a very reliable spacecraft, uh, and all these years has been a proven spacecraft can take people from Earth up in space and back to Earth without uh, problems. Okay, Paolo, because of the delay on the line, uh, I've got a lot of viewers' questions to put to you, but first of all, perhaps you would just explain what you're doing in terms of experiments up there. Just give us a, give us a little tour uh, around the laboratory there on the International Space Station. Yes, so this is one of the three major laboratories that there are on board of the International Space Station. There is a U.S. laboratory, Japanese laboratory, and a European laboratory. These laboratories are interested because they are modular. Each one of these, uh, of these uh, structure, they're called racks, and, uh, and can accommodate uh, a full facility to carry out an experiment in certain discipline or uh, drawers that have a single experiment. And the interesting part is that these racks are modular. They can be positioned anywhere on the floor, on the ceiling. I can easily go on the ceiling and work here uh, how, how I would not be able to do in space, I mean, on, on the ground. And while I'm here on the ceiling, somebody else can be working here on the side. So it's, it's very interesting because you get these uh, multiplication effects. We have uh, facilities, and by the way, once in a while you get lost, so I'm trying to figure out where, this, where is the camera now. Um, uh, we have facilities that do, uh, can, can uh, have us doing experiments on life science, uh, material science, uh, uh, physiology. I mean, we, have, we can do almost everything uh, that any scientist on Earth can dream about. And presumably, this is one of the reasons ESA and you as an astronaut would say it's essential to keep funding a space exploration like this because of the, the value of, of experiments that can be carried out and have uh, impact back on Earth. Well, uh, uh, yes, the, the, the fact that we go here in space, and, and the main reason is because here we, found, we find an environment that we don't have on Earth. And, uh, and 
what uh, what what you cannot do on Earth, you can do easily here. You know, when once you remove gravity from the equation, things behave in a really different way up here in space, and and so you can you can do things that are that are really different. So as And, and uh, so, for example, water floats around, so a lot of things happen here. And, and taking away gravity, you, can, you end up being able to do a lot of, a lot of things that on Earth are simply impossible. How does that make things like showering? Sorry, say it again. How does that make things like showering or just normal bathroom activities? Well, interesting. Uh, it, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I, 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 I think I have a, a lot of fun coming up here because it's like being a kid, you know, rediscovering everything. You try to do things the way you are, you are, you normally do, and they don't work. You simply find yourself very frustrated, and and so you need to learn everything from scratch. That like walking, and of course you cannot walk here. You go around uh, using your hands, and and showering is another thing. We 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 actually cannot shower because. Uh, Water will go all over the place. So what we usually do, we take a towel, uh, put some uh, water with some soap, and use it in this way. We have uh, a special shampoo that we can put in our hair and they dry in that way. We brush our teeth and uh, dream of every kid. We actually swallow everything. So you can do things uh, here, and it's, uh, it's pretty good, I would say. Let's go to some of the, the questions from our viewers all over the world. Stephen McGrath uh, from Manchester, Vermont in the United States, uh, he wants to know what it's like sleeping in space, because presumably you need to be strapped in, don't you? Actually, uh, it's very interesting because uh, if, we were, if, we were, if I would let myself go like this, I would ju just fall asleep and, and it would be okay. I mean, uh, the only problem is that there is always air circulation in these modules because the air would not circulate by itself. So there is a force, a circulation, air has to be a clean and continuously replenished with the oxygen. So uh, this, this force ventilation uh, drives you in a certain way and if you don't pay attention, eventually you end up with your head stuck in one of the, of the grills where the, the air is sucked in. So what, do we, what we do at night, we have a crew quarters, which is a little, um, a little place where we, can, uh, where we can go in, and inside there, there is a sleeping bag uh, uh, where we actually go in, and it's just for a containment. Mine is just uh, fixed uh, at the bottom uh, by the feet, and then I'm floating around. So I, I find myself, I wake up in the morning, and I'm in all sorts of weird position, but I have to say that it's really, really comfortable. I'll take your word for it. Uh, Theo Russell uh, from London says, how does your body clock adapt to orbiting the Earth so rapidly? Do you suffer from space lag? Does this disrupt your sleep and, uh, and other functions as well? Uh, and one question that struck us, what time is it up there? Because it must be moving more quickly, isn't it? Actually, this is an interesting question coming from uh, UK because we actually use GMT time. So the current time now it's one, actually 2.19, and, and this is the time we use. Uh, we, act, we are a little bit shifted towards the Moscow time, so we do things a little bit earlier than we would be doing them if we would be in London, but the time is actually the London time. And uh, it's true, we are rotating around Earth so fast that every every 40 minutes we have a sunrise or a sunset, so like 16 sunrises or sunsets per day. And if you would be looking outside the window, you will get totally confused. But we actually sync our clock according to our body clock, according to the working day. So we try to go to bed around 10, 11, midnight, wake up around 6, uh, and then we have the working day. It's, uh, it's still a little bit uh, strange where in the middle of the day I look at the map, and by the way, we'll be over 
exactly above uh, the London vertical in 15 minutes, uh, I would go. I would go there and look outside. It's pitch dark down on Earth, and it's the middle of the day. Or time to go to bed for me, and I go and take a look at the window, and it's, it's sunny somewhere. So it's a little bit uh, uh, shocking at the beginning, but the body gets adjusted adjusted pretty quickly. How are you coping with life with your fellow astronauts? I mean, how do you resolve maybe problems that arise over a six-month period? Well, uh, we, we get up here as a crew, and there are six people on board of the space station right now, and uh, we, we know each other very well. Uh, we have been training uh, uh, for uh, at least two years, if not more, in the case of my fellow American uh, astronauts. And uh, we do have uh, a way to address issues that may pop up. Uh, we have uh, uh, what is called crew resource management. So we, we talk, we bring forward things, and uh, everything is going uh, really good. So far, we had absolutely no problems. Uh, everybody knows uh, what are their roles, and uh, we try to establish rules rules like uh, you don't pull out something and leave it there, uh, I mean, <laughs> try to clean up uh, uh, after yourself, things like this, and so far absolutely no problem. Okay, uh, another question just about space and exploration. Christian Reyes from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, United States. Can you see lots of stars from the space station, or does the light reflected from the Earth block them out? That's an interesting question uh, coming from Christian there. Actually, yes, we can see the stars. Uh, and uh, at the interesting thing, though, is that our cupola, which is our, our uh, view down on Earth, is perpendicular, usually is perpendicular down to Earth. So we always see the Earth with parts of the sky around. And, uh, and you can actually see the stars uh, uh, pretty well at night. Uh, but, but I would say they are not really more more visible than, than down from Earth. Uh, ex uh, of course, you have to be outside of a city. I mean, they are a little bit clearer. Uh, you can see all of them. Uh, you can see the Milky Way very nicely. Uh, but they are not closer. People think that we are close to them, and we see better. They are actually at the same distance as they are if we were on Earth. What about weather systems, La Nina, the terrible flooding that we've seen uh, not only in Australia but Brazil? How evident is that from where you are in terms of cloud formation? Actually, this is uh, interesting to me because uh, the first time I came in space and I looked outside the window, I figured out that there are a lot of clouds over Earth. I mean, uh, I, I, would, I would guess that 60, 70 percent of the Earth's surface is covered by clouds, and uh, and so it looks very. Uh, I mean, this this clear skies that we see from from uh, Earth sometimes for days here do not exist because there is always a cloud there, and uh, and so it it looks uh, that these uh, atmospheric phenomena are always there, and and uh, it's very difficult to actually see down. And at least for me, I, I guess a trained eye maybe can do that, but for me, uh, looking down, I you, I cannot figure out there is anything specific different in any uh, location. We are still trying to use our lenses to focus down on the area in Australia and Brazil, and even in Europe with a lot of snow. Uh, we are trying to see if we can pinpoint some of these places, but so far I, I personally had no luck. Okay, we have uh, Pete Chung from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. My question is uh, as one of the few chosen who's made it outside the Earth's atmosphere, what is the, the moral and emotional pull that may come to you as you look back to the Earth through the windows of the International Space Station? Well, a couple of, uh, a couple of things. Uh, uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's amazing here from Earth that, that you really don't see any boundary, anything. I mean, it's Earth, and, and, and it shows that we are all together in this, 
as and, and the earth is our home, our environment. Uh, so we really need to start thinking in terms of humanity all together instead of little countries kind of fighting uh, each other. Uh, and, and by the way, we are all close together, at least seen from up here. And the other thing is that uh, uh, I always, uh, especially during sunset or sunrise, I see the atmosphere being illuminated by the sun. And, I, and I, you can see, I can see how the atmosphere is so thin in respect to the earth. And, and uh, it gives me an impression of fragility. And, and I'm thinking that we really need to pay attention and, and be careful of what we are doing because, because the earth is fragile. It's beautiful but fragile, and we need to be careful there. One last question, I'm afraid, uh, Paolo. This is from Buzz Purdy. It's a bit more prosaic. Uh, there's never much talk about what the atmosphere and smells are like in space. Uh, without gravity, particles may settle in out-of-the-way places and things. How important is hygiene? And just as a rider to that, in terms of the, uh, the water recycling system, uh, is that quite tricky when you're facing a cup of coffee in the morning, knowing where it's come from? All uh, great questions. So the, um, I, I'm, I'm very, very surprised, but the atmosphere here is very good. Uh, I would even say better than a regular house. I mean, because normally in the house, uh, once in a while you need to open the window and, and exchange the air. Obviously here we cannot open the window and exchange air, but uh, the life support system is doing this for us. So we continuously have open windows that suck in the air, clean it, uh, replenish it with oxygen, and spew it out again. And I, I, I really never smell anything, nor have uh, any problem here. It, it, it's very good. If there is a little bit of, uh, of uh, something. It's just because all the fluids come up uh, and, and make your head a little bit uh, uh, full. Um, and for what concerns the recycling of uh, water, I always uh, tell uh, people on Earth that if they think they are drinking brand new water, they are dreaming. It's also, also that one is recycled. I mean, it's not that we have new water, we use it and then we throw it away. The water that we throw out of the tap goes somewhere, gets uh, clean and comes back again. So maybe in a lower percentage, but we all use recycled water. I have to say that the water here is uh, uh, controlled every every day. Uh, there are instrumentation there are instrumentation that really make sure that it's uh, clear, free of contaminants, and uh, and actually, I'm afraid that I'm drinking much better water up here than what I was drinking back at home. Well, Paolo, Paolo Nespoli, it has been fascinating speaking to you. Thank you very much indeed. Paolo Nespoli on the International Space Station. You too, it's a pleasure to have you up here on board of the station. We will uh, come back again. We will let you look outside the window, enjoy this magnificent uh, view. And uh, I'm looking forward for, in the future, everybody to be able to come up here visit and see the earth from uh, up here. Bye. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you, BBC World News Station. And Houston ACR, thank you. Appreciate we are now it. resuming normal audio communications.